Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campania. The big news that's been going on uh, for the last couple of days is, uh, well, unfortunately, it's, it, first of all, it's the Sally Yates conversation and, uh, and the, all of the uh, meetings and, and, and interrogations going on. Perhaps interrogations is too strong of a word. But with regards to what's going on in the White House and Donald Trump and now the firing of James Comey, the FBI director, and, and how coincidental that is that, uh, that all of that is happening. That's all the huge stuff going on. So the real question that I have is, as we look at all of that, and yes, I'm jumping right into this. I Very little setup for this. And we're going to go into more conversation with my guest here in a minute. But I really want to talk about this piece for a moment and ask a question. If we've got a potential situation that in any way mirrors or resembles Watergate, in which case this one kind of does, and some people have acknowledged, yeah, it kind of does. Why are we not addressing it? Why are we not calling for independent investigations requiring it? Why is the GOP continuing to obstruct? And Mitch McConnell today, not even an hour ago, said that he intends to obstruct any request or suggestion that we do an independent inquiry into Donald Trump's connections to Russia and any of his campaign people and staff throughout the entire campaign and since then. Refusing, doesn't want to see it. Donald Trump yesterday, th with a letter, fires James Comey a couple of days, like a day after the, the, the testimony given by Sally Yates, a couple of days after James Comey asked for more money for investigation into the Trump connection with Russia, and now he's fired. So if you go through that, Sally Yates was fired, Parit Bahara was fired, James Comey was fired, all of the people who were investigating any aspect of what Trump was doing with his businesses and or with his ties to Russia, sometimes those are the same, they've all been fired. And we have Sessions, the new attorney general, who is supposed to have recused himself from everything from, the e from Hillary Clinton's emails straight through to right now and all of the conversations having to do with Trump Russia. He was supposed to have recused himself as of a couple of months ago. What does he do? He was the one who actually wrote a secondary letter to go along with the deputy attorney general suggesting that they fire James Comey because of his handling of the Hillary Clinton emails. Very coincidental that it happens at this moment that all of this comes together right now. My question is, how is it and why is it that they are continuing. The entire GOP, from Trump and the entire GOP, is complicit and is collaborating. Why are they continuing to be complicit and collaborative with this president in this situation? Why are they not requiring and coming out re demanding this special investigation? Why? What is it that they have to hide? What is it that Trump has to hide? And why is it that they're choosing party over country? because that's what they're doing. That's my question, and I really want an answer to that. My guest today is not going to be able to answer that question, but I <laughs> wanted to get this out because, yeah, it's something we need to think about, it's something we need to really drive. There are marches coming up. There are demonstrations coming up. There are things coming up trying to demand this stuff, and we all need to be there. <clears throat> I'll say it again. Our voice is necessary. We must raise our voice, and it's the voice of the people that it provides the purpose for what we're doing and we need your voice there, and then we need our actions in order to be the strength. We all need to be there, and we all need to do something. Because it's not about party, it's about country. And it's about our democracy, and that's what's being attacked at the moment. So, okay, sorry, I had to go off on that rant for a minute, but okay. Um, all right, for the rest of the show, we're gonna talk about something else. We're gonna talk about the policy of power. And by policy of power, I mean electricity and fuel and what really helps this country go from, from that perspective. So we're going to get into that and some of the challenges nationally and locally going on with that. So with that, I will introduce my guest, Mr. Cy Weiss. Um, Cy has been, thank you, welcome, welcome to the show, Cy. Thank you. Uh, Cy has spent, uh, what was it, six years? Six years in D.C. Uh, working on energy policy, I believe. Um, and we're going to learn a bit more about what he was doing there and, and the implications and what made him want to leave, uh, possibly. Um, and then what some of those impacts are here. So Sai's got some experience there. Sai, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. I appreciate it. Please tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you come from, what you've been doing, and what kind of got you where you are right now with, with this conversation. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, just a correction, I'm actually, I spent about six months in D.C. Six um, months, okay. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, six <laughs> months. And But I, I spent about six months on the mainland uh, going both to school and also working. 
Um, I studied environmental science, uh, specifically sustainability, sustainability and policy, as well as um, economics. Where at? So Southern Oregon University. Okay. A excellent. small little uh, hippie town called Ashland. Oh, Ashland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shakespeare Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatnot. Um, so I. Uh, but you got to spend six months in, in DC. DC. Yes, okay. correct. What were you doing there? So I was working for a policy firm called American Council on Renewable Energy. Um, they're also called ACOR. Uh, we represented Fortune 500 companies such as GE, Goldman Sachs, Google, um, basically all the big players that had assets in renewable energy. Um, so we looked at uh, advocating for wind, uh, geothermal, uh, photovoltaics, uh, both thermal, um, solar as well, in addition to biomass and biofuels. So we had an array of basically a smorgasbord of different energy types that we advocated for. Um, and my time spent there was a lot of fun, um, very engaging with both the uh, industry leaders as well as uh, politicians and people at the Capitol and just bringing everyone to the table and discussing how can we move our energy policy forward that benefits all Americans. And when were you there? I was there the fall of uh, fall and winter of 2014. Okay, going so fall and winter of 2014, and and that was part of the completion of your degree, or or after your degree. That was after the completion of my degree. Okay, so, so the first thing you did after you got your degree is you went. I went straight to. I jumped right into the DC uh, engine over there. Yeah. So actually, I was our office was on 1600 and K. I'm not sure if you know where that is exactly in DC, but that was just literally uh, uh, just down the street from the White House. Wow, okay, so, so yeah. you were there for six months. Yes. In the thick of those conversations, yes. right. you're taking furious notes. I was, and I was planning to stay there longer, but uh, you know, what we'll talk about on this show is yeah, on yeah. the reason why I came back to our beautiful state of Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay, with that, you came back to Hawaii. Where, where are you from? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm originally from the Big Island, a small little rainy town called Hilo. Uh, I graduated from Hilo High School. Um, and then, like I said, I moved on to go to school in Oregon. In Oregon, um, and then. Right, yeah. and then to, uh, to D.C., and then back to then here, back to Honol here. Honolulu. Right. Now, when um, did you get back here? I got back here almost two years ago, so June almost will be two, okay. two years. Yeah. All right, and um, okay, so you're right in the middle then of, of having these conversations. You're right in the middle of the policy mm -hmm. discussions and arguments uh, from in 2014 as far as how we can move the country forward, how we can make it better from an energy perspective, both electricity and fuel right. for the country. Exactly. What would, be, what would you say was the greatest lesson in, that you have learned in, in that six month period of time? Um, it's a great, well, great question. So we were actually a nonpartisan organization, so we didn't choose either, um, you know, either side of the aisle. We were right in the middle. We wanted to bring all stakeholders, and, that, and to me, I think that was the biggest uh, lesson for me is how to bring everyone together. Um, because at the end of the day, either if you wave a red flag or a blue flag, we all all, all are under the same flag, which is the American flag. Ultimately, so, and we yes. need to remember that. Right, exactly. We don't always seem to remember exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so um, at that time is how do we create the language to bring everyone to the table so we all agree on the same energy policy issues? Okay, so how do we create the policy language that can make people agree? Mm -hmm. So some people are going to agree on spec because it's what some people believe is better for the environment. Right. Um, other people will need to be convinced because, well, I don't care about the environment part, but what I see is regulations, and I see it's going to cost more, and I see all these different issues. So, so were you able to be successful in getting some of that, uh, or, or not you personally, but your right. group? Our our group, our communications group, was, uh, I would say, pretty successful in bringing everyone to the table in terms of everyone understanding the benefits of renewable energy to our economy. So we specifically, one of our campaigns were to uh, pinpoint certain states that had large, uh, or excuse me, a lot of jobs in renewable energy. So we focused in states like Texas and Iowa, okay. which are large deployers of wind. Um, and Not and, a lot of people know that, I think. Right. That, that Texas and Iowa, which are two fairly strongly Republican states, so politics has to be there for a moment. Mm -hmm. Strongly Republican states, and Texas in particular, that has a huge stake in the oil industry, 
Does Iowa have a stake in the oil industry? No, but they are big producers of corn, and that corn is primarily used for ethanol. For ethanol, okay, yes. uh, which is one of the things we've tried here in Hawaii that mm -hmm. doesn't work here in Hawaii for a couple of reasons that previous shows we've talked about. Um, so, okay, so important little snippet there to know that Iowa and Texas are really big in the wind industry. Yeah, some of the largest producers, uh, yes, that's, in, that's, a, in our country. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Well, go on. Go on. Go on. So, yeah. So, the, the, the success around those states, if we look at this as a case study, is that uh, we've, over a time period, and it's not something that happens overnight, have wrote um, strong policy to advocate for farmers to farm basically wind. So we write okay. in the farm bill that wind is a commodity that you can farm and you can produce, and there are incentives for producing wind. The largest incentive being the production tax credit, um, which is a big thing for both investors and landowners. Yeah, because it could be broken up in different ways. You've got your land use credits, you've got your production credits, and those can go to different locations, as well as your just your technology credits right. can add it in as well. As you layer these in, it makes investors very happy. Exactly, and, it, and the farmer wins out as well because it's another revenue stream for it's them. It's another revenue stream, perhaps being able to use a piece of land that they can't otherwise grow something on. Exactly, and they're not pressured to rely on that one crop. Um, and you know, and it just makes exactly huge. diversification, and yeah. uh, it's it's going to be extremely important going into the future because with um, inevitable human caused climate change, uh, you know, with the changing of seasons and how that affects crop production, you know, they're going to farmers are going to be needing to look for another revenue stream down the road, and we think that you know. Um, Either. That's an important topic all into itself as far as our farmers are concerned and whether we're right. talking locally and by the way I don't know if you know this but we have 7,000 local farmers right well, in Hawaii. That's a lot. Well, yeah. some, of, some of them are really small but mm -hmm. they're actually farmers and then some obviously larger ones. So across the country what, 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 what do farmers do? They produce food for us to eat. Mm -hmm. And if they're having a hard time, if they're struggling, which is why we always have ag bills, which is why we're always trying to supplement and incentivize and create various ways to make sure that we're keeping them going, uh, right? But then we also have some groups and some organizations that take advantage of that mm -hmm. as well. Um, to, to call a few out, we've got the Monsantos and the Pioneers, who they do some good work in some areas, but some of the ways they go about it, pesticides and some of the other means and methods that they use, aren't always environmentally friendly or locally friendly. And that's a whole other topic, but it's important to recognize that trying to find ways to work with not just investors, but the farmers. Trying to find ways to mm -hmm. keep the farmers moving, diversify them, make sure they've got a stable baseline revenue for themselves, right? Right, and there's an awesome quote by uh, Richard Ha, actually, a farmer on yeah. the Big Island. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good family friend of mine. He, he says, the farmer's gonna farm if, as long as they can make money, you know? Yeah. And so we have to have an incentive for our farmers to be able to have some kind of way to bring in some revenue. Yeah. Um, we would love them to farm food, but if we diversify food and energy, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, agreed, um, agreed, agreed. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I, I got to write a resolution this year that nice. was is calling for biofuels mm -hmm. and really having the full supply chain, but setting up a biofuels industry here in Hawaii and have that coincide with food growth so that we are supplementing in that same way and providing more opportunities for farmers to utilize their land for biofuels as well as for food because of that baseline revenue thing. If right. we can give the farmers that baseline revenue, they're going to be able to grow, they're going to be able to expand and grow more food and more options so that we can get more locally produced food. Eventually, maybe we can start exporting some of Exactly, exactly. And not to get too much in the weeds, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a farmer on average makes 2000 to 5000 per wind turbine. So, uh, you okay. know, that's, that's a lot for yeah, a farmer. Per, per month? Or? Um, I, think it's, I think it's an annual basis. Two to, two to five thousand dollars? Two thousand to five thousand dollars per turbine. Per turbine? Yeah, per wind okay. turbine on their land. Here in Hawaii or? I think this is mainland prices, so mainland in, the, prices. In, in the Midwest okay. primarily. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and like, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very 
it's a sliding number, so it yeah. depends on wh where you are in the United States and the power prices. Sure, uh, yes, because right. it's all, yeah, it's right. always based on regional regional pricing of, and, and and what those incentives are and how they work. Exactly, and in talking about regional pricing, I think there's also we got to look at regional energy choices too, because yeah. we can't just be polarized in one energy choice. We exactly. can't be 100% exactly. solar. We can't We're be already halfway through the show. How about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cy, for joining us again. It's uh, Mr. Cy Weiss has joined us to talk about energy policy and. We dug in a little bit there. We're going to get a bit more going. So thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii. We'll be back in one minute. Thank you. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. DiveHeart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Yeah. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Once again, please welcome Mr. Cy Weiss to the show. We're talking about policy of power. So. What, what I want to do now is uh, shift a bit to not just the reason you came home, but what were the conditions? So you were, two years ago you came back. Mm -hmm. You left D.C. for the six months that you spent there trying to create some policy stuff. And, and there were some changes happening, and there was some tumult happening, and mm -hmm. obviously there have been changes since then, and some of them more drastic. So let's start by saying, okay, what were the conditions at the time you were there and how did some of that maybe lead you to wanting to leave D.C.? Right. So when I got there, the uh, election, midterm election, was actually going on. And so the House actually just flipped to be a majority Republican. So um, even though we are a, no, uh, a nonpartisan organization, we really didn't have to convince Democrats about renewable energy. It would be like preaching to the choir. Right. But our our biggest effort was to talk to Republicans um, and conservatives about renewable energy policy. So Let that me ask shifted a question about that though. Yeah. It, 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 with that being your focus, right. you had to learn the words to say to them. You had to learn what messaging would mm -hmm. get through to them. Mm -hmm. Was that hard to do or was that something that was easy to discover? I think if you really boil it down and you look at some of their values, you can bring that into the discussion. Okay. For, so for example, one of the things that conservative energy policymakers tout is that we should get rid of government incentives for um, picking winners and losers. And at ACOR, we're actually pretty ambitious, and we actually said, sure, let's take um, all government incentives out, because if we actually even the playing field, renewables would win. Yeah, because um, you're talking about the subsidies that go for, exactly, for oil and petroleum. Exactly. So yeah, which that, they refuse, by the way. They don't admit. Right. There are so many conversations I've had with people who are, uh, uh, even even some who are pro renewable energy, but still refuse to admit the significant billions of dollars worth of subsidies that go to the oil industry. So it's fascinating. So okay, I'm sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, so no, out. exactly. And so we we wanted a diversification of our energy resources, um, and that's one of the things that we used as leverage was that to say, well, if we if you are going by that logic then we should go full throttle. Yeah. Um, and that would actually benefit renewables, like I said, in the, in the end, and it would save taxpayers money. Absolutely, because it's otherwise hypocritical. Exactly. And so the nature of different countries is you tend to prop up an uh, a area of the economy in its infancy. And you, that's the role yeah. uh, you know, of pro governments around the world. What they do is they, so for example, a case study would be Korea and automakers. So um, after the Korean War, they be slowly became industrialized. And one of the things they wanted to do, and they looked at you know, Japan as a playbook, was 
we want to build cars and sell them to the world, right, and prop up our economy. So the Korean government actually went in and helped to, you know, prop up and incentivize and provide um, low interest loans to these auto manufacturers. And now there's Korean cars running around every day competing with Absolutely. both the Japanese, American, and um, and they were the first and European automakers. They were the first ones to offer the 10-year uh, warranties and all that as well. Right, right. So 10-year, hundred thousand mile warranty. Exactly. So yeah. I mean, at, that's just a case study of what government does in terms of helping industries prop up. Yeah. So the oil and gas industry actually had the same thing when it was in its infancy. Yes. Believe it or not, during the Industrial Revolution, right? Yeah. When we Going moved back from, into the 1800s, the late exactly. 1800s, and through the 1920s and 30s. Exactly. Yeah. And so when petroleum production became more efficient, more cost effective, um, and more actually more understood, then you had the government start to slowly scale back, but not actually fully scale back because we wanted, have a lot of... Right, wanted to scale exactly. back, but yeah. Right, and it's almost like a drug, you know, as, as soon as the money comes in, you don't want to say no. Right. But we want to say, well, petroleum and fossil fuels had their day, right? Had yeah. their day in the sun, and now it's time for a renewable we energy. To, we need to transition. Exactly. Let's ratchet this down over here so we can ratchet up over here. Exactly. Because this, well, as those of us in the choir believe, that's the future, what the future should be for many of us who believe that. Right, right. So that's the kind of rhetoric we, we, we were going to use. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, they don't want to listen to that. So no, then. No, that's so, not a Republican talking point. Right, there. right. So. At the end of the day, that's when we come up with the, you know, with the notion that let's just get rid of all of uh, government subsidies altogether. If that's if well, that's the way it's going to be, and that's a strategy. Right. That's a that's a strategy tactic that you'll use in right. order to say, okay, well, if you want to get rid of the renewable energy ones, you got to get rid of yours too. Exactly. Okay, no, we don't want to do that. Exactly. All right, fine. Well, let's get that off the table. Right. Let's move to the next thing. Right. It seems to me what uh, thinking about it. I I don't have a re Republican brain. But what I've seen in the conversations is what seems to drive them is where is the money and how does the money flow and how do we make sure that, number one, there's a balance that's happening and the transition is managed and how do, how do we maintain the money for the power sources that want the money? Right. So it seems like that conversation needs to be there and I, there have been some YouTube videos here there of people talking about, well, this is an easy way to do that is tie it to the money and tie it to how... You know, if you just invest in this instead of that, your money will still mm -hmm. be there, kind of a thing. Well, so so what kind of, we have to get back to this other part of it. But so you had some success mm -hmm. there, trying to get that language for some policy, right? And, and that was through that was after the the midterm elections mm -hmm. became Republican mm -hmm. uh, controlled. Was was there actual success there, or or what happened? And then clearly it was mostly to go downhill. Right, and it was mostly surface level talks at that point. Um, okay. And we actually had a transition in our leadership within the organization that actually fully prompted me to actually just leave altogether. Uh, okay, so okay, so first of all, Acor was working with what was at the time a primarily Democrat controlled house, and then it flipped and became a Republican controlled house. So you mm -hmm. went from being able to get some positive policy in to having surface level conversation only with the Republican controlled house. Right. right. And, and and then you got a new leadership at ACOR. Right. And and not only that, but I with the one hundred percent renewable energy uh, goal was established in Hawaii and that was the the leading, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. I said Hawaii's wanting to do it. Hawaii wants to go 100%. They want to invest the time and money and sweat equity in making this reality happen. And so I said, this is where I want to focus my energy. Okay. You want this to come is, home. Right. This come is, home and help it. Yeah, and yeah. exactly, and cultivate uh, the needed strength to make that reality, to make it a reality. And, and what have you found since you've returned in that area? Uh, so I've worked in various energy companies here since then, um, since I've returned. Uh, and with energy metering policies changing and storage, you know, in its infancy, um, things have been a little bit of a roller coaster. Or in the solar industry, I'm sure you've know, heard this term, but the solar coaster, mm -hmm. um, it's been up and down. But you know, I have hope in that um, in the next five to six years, you know, we'll see a smooth transition to where renewables actually will have solid footing, will have two legs to run, and be able to fully compete with fossil fuels on a levelized cost basis. Yeah. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, ingenuity 
uh, the economics around it and sound policy. Well, and y yes, um, but that also going back to the biofuels thing is, mm -hmm. and I know you went into some of that as well with biomass stuff. That's where if we're able to actually establish a biofuels industry here and really grow that up and each island could have its own version of it and we created a fuel standard, renewable fuel standard, which we kind of have, but it, it, isn't, it isn't as clear and it isn't right. directed the way we want it to be. Mm -hmm. One of the bills that we had this year that didn't pass was uh, creating that re renewable fuel standard right. by 2045 to 100% the same right. way. It didn't pass. So how does that jive with your belief that, hey, it's 100%, we want to go there, you wanted to come back home to help it happen, and bills like that don't pass? What does that mean to you in your understanding of the progress? It's not going to be easy. I mean, it's not going to, some, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. Um, but I think over time, sooner that would be nice. But I think with uh, policies and um, legislators that are, you know, going in and out of becoming in and out of office, I think that there is there is hope. I, you know, I'm very hopeful in that there is an awakening within our society mm -hmm. that this is a priority. And I not only see this as an environmental issue, Carl, I also see this as a national security issue. Yes. Um, first and so foremost. It's a national security issue, it's an energy security issue. Yes, and yeah. being an island nation, you know, it's gonna it's be- a sustainability. Yeah, issue. exactly, and it's gonna be extremely pertinent going into the future, knowing that our United States military can be able to fuel ourselves and to not be feeling the shocks of oil prices when we yes. do go into some kind of large global con conflict. Yes. Um, well, that was the, sort of the premise behind the Great Green Fleet that they wanted right. a few years ago, and they were exactly. able to achieve some of that. And mm -hmm. that's where you know, the, whole, the whole gift pack program that I actually got to participate in some of. And that has led us to, and so we understand one of the stakeholders is here in Hawaii, right? let alone nationally or globally, is our Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. And their interest in having drop-in green fuels is, is significant. Um, so that's one of the stakeholders. The airline industry is a stakeholder. So we've got two large stakeholders say, yes, we want this. And the reason we want this is the point you just made. Stable cost, stable pricing. We don't have the price shocks that go on. There, everybody would be, from a business perspective, again, if you want to talk Republican, from a business perspective, from a bottom line perspective, I would rather know that I'm going to pay $60 per barrel for the next 20 years then 60, 40, 100, 70, 120, 60. Right. You right. have no idea from year to year or even quarter to quarter where you're going to be. Right, and I, don't, and I totally agree. And I think that we can't just hang our hat on policy. It's going to take ingenuity. Yeah. So it's going to take the uh, businesses and entrepreneurs to find solutions that drive down costs for consumers and for, um, for energy producers. That way we can compete and provide a plentiful, affordable, renewable energy. I, I agree with that. So what, uh, we have just a couple minutes left. What, what do you say, we, what, what's, what policy and then what action do you think we need to be looking at for this, for the, I guess for the next legislative session or for this next year and years right. to come? What is it that you think we, from, from the experiences you've had and from the conversations, policy conversations going back to, and we didn't even get into the EPA part, but um, conversations that have happened, where are we in, in that perspective? Or what, what, what do you think we really need? What, what are a couple of ideas that we need to make sure that we're addressing to help us achieve that? We need to elect officials that support renewable energy, period. And we not, need not all of our officials do, right. it seems. Uh, and it's not just on the Republican-Democrat line. Right. So we need to make sure that people are congruent with our national security issues, with our environmental issues, and with the issues of bringing down costs for Hawaii residents. Because yes. at the end of the day, you know, we pay some of the highest costs. We, we pay almost the highest cost of living in the United States. Yeah. So it would well, be. Per capita as well, if you look at it that way. Right. I mean, you know, San Francisco has high cost of living True. as well. Yeah. Um, New York has high cost of living. Mm -hmm. But when you compare all of that, and look at Hawaii and then look at how our revenues work here and right. the challenges of being an island you know, right. this far away as well. Exactly, so a price shock would, would be a huge disadvantage to our Hawaii uh, yeah. oh, residents yeah. oh, because yeah. we can't afford that. We literally cannot afford that. Right. So, so that's, that's the security part. Exactly. That's it, is having it available and having the security knowing that we don't have to worry about being mm -hmm. left without in the middle of you know in the middle of the island the island in the middle of the ocean yeah. uh, in the middle of the pacific mm -hmm. uh, being left without it so okay uh, we are at the end of our show
Uh, so unfortunately, we didn't get to, there's a lot more we can cover. We can talk about this all night exactly. if you wanted to. I would like you to come back again okay. to talk. We'll try to pinpoint uh, a couple more specific issues. I'd like to talk about the EPA and the, and the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy as well, so we can have you come back as well and talk about that. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Cy Weiss. Thank you, for, uh, all of you, for listening in. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, a Politics in Hawaii series. Thank you to the staff and the crew and everyone here at Think Tech Hawaii. We'll see you next week when I'm going to have Mr. Tim Vanderveer, chair of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, here, to, talking about some, some of the initiatives that he's working on uh, with the party. So thank you.